Okay, well, <clears throat> welcome back to chapter 17. Yesterday, if you did the notes in 17.3, I think what we discussed was uh, obviously the different forms of imperialism in different parts of Africa, and we ended with the brutality, the murder, the genocide that took place in the Belgian Congo. So, before we move on to the next essential question, I want to clarify a couple things about the Belgian Congo that I kind of messed up a little bit yesterday, and it's not about the Belgian Congo, but about how all of this came to light. So I want to do just a quick slide of notes, and I want to show you guys how all of this information about what was going on in the Congo came to light. Well, interestingly enough, it all started with this guy named George Washington Williams. Now, George Washington Williams was an African-American Civil War veteran. He was a journalist. He was a politician. We'll talk about that. Um, and George Washington Williams kind of did something uh, unique uh, in the 19th century. He went to Belgium to interview King Leopold II. All right. Uh, he wanted to do a kind of tour of, of, of different parts of Africa. And uh, he interviewed Leopold II, and when he walked away from the interview of Leopold II, he said, Oh, you know what? This guy's a pretty awesome guy. He must be doing great things in the Congo. Well, let me go see. So what George Washington Williams does is he actually travels to the Congo Free State. Uh, he's an African-American reporter at this time. He's a journalist at this time. And he goes to the Congo Free State. And as you can imagine, what he sees... And what he witnesses is in no way what King Leopold II described as his Congo. All right? So, he uncovers all the slavery. He uncovers the murder. He uncovers the rubber, the exploitation, and uh, a horde of myriad of other things he discovers going on in the Congo. So, George Washington Williams was actually the first guy to really break the news as to what was going on in the Congo. All right, so he actually writes this letter called, uh, this is him addressing the Ohio legislature. By the way, he was the first African-American elected to the Ohio state legislature in the 1880s. And this is him talking uh, to the legislature. But anyway, he wrote what was called an open letter to his serene majesty king leopold ii and there's a longer title than that but basically he writes this open letter to king leopold and you can read it online if you just google uh an open letter to his serene majesty leopold ii by george washington williams you can read the whole letter it's really long but in this letter he describes in detail the things that he saw now after reading this letter, uh, I haven't read it, guys, in probably six or seven years. I totally forgot about it. Uh, but I reread the letter this morning, and it's really interesting the kinds of things that he says. So, do you remember Henry Morton Stanley, that guy I told you about? Well, here's, here's what George Washington Williams said. Uh, some of the things would go down. So, one of the ways that the, Belgian Cong or the, the Belgians would take control is they would go to different tribal chiefs, and they would kind of... Um, uh, trick them, all right? And they would trick them into signing away their land, and they would trick them into signing their way th uh, away their people. Now, some of this was just very simply, hey, if you sign this piece of paper, we will give you European stuff. And a tribal chief of the Congo, not really knowing what he was signing, just knowing that he would get European stuff that they did not have in the Congo, signed it, and got the stuff. But what the tribal chiefs really didn't realize is that they were signing away their land, and their people, and their resources in perpetuity, which means forever, all right? So, that was one way they did it, but another way is this, and this is something that was in the letter. He said, sometimes, um, Stanley and other white leaders, in order to take control of Congolese land, would do a, a, a manner of tricks. One trick he described was hooking up a battery hidden in the coat of a European. And this battery had wire connected to a piece of metal in the hand of a white European. Have you guys ever seen one of those tricks where they have like a shocking thing in your hand and when you shake hands with somebody you get shocked? That's what the Europeans in some cases were doing. They would walk up to a tribal chief and have like a little electric battery hooked up to a device in their hand and when they shook the hand of the tribal chief, the tribal chief would receive a hard shock and think 
that the white Europeans had some kind of power. Now, another way they tricked European, or excuse me, Cong Congolese chiefs, uh, according to this letter, was there was one instance where one of the, the white European officials held out a cigar to a tribal chief, used a magnifying glass, pointed the magnifying glass at the sun, and then the magnifying glass lit the cigar. And then he began smoking the cigar. So, and then the uh, official went on to tell the tribal chief, we are from the sun. These white Europeans, we have the power of the sun. And just like we can light this cigar, we can burn entire villages. But using modern science as a trick, do you guys see that? They were using modern science as a trick to trick the Congolese people into turning over their lands and their people and the resources like rubber. So anyway, guys, fascinating this letter and I totally forgot about it uh, but if you want to read it I mean it describes a lot of crazy stuff going on in the Congo but a lot of the stuff I've already told you about so after George Washington Williams delivers his letter uh, it exposed the world to the abuses in the Congo people around the world read the letter and they became familiar with it and that led to Europeans like E.D. Morrell and uh, uh, official Roger Casement, uh, they continued the investigation and they brought the news to the world, which eventually brought everything to trial, which basically got uh, what I told you yesterday, King Leopold had to give up all of his wealth and his resources, the palace, and they had to turn it over to Belgium. Now, you can go to this day and visit the palace in Belgium. I have a relative that went there a few years ago, and she said it was amazing. It was beautiful. Then I had her read this book where I got a lot of this information. It's called King Leopold's Ghost. And when she found out about the Congo, she was horrified that she had been standing in a palace built on the blood and murder of the Congolese people. So, still there today. All right? By the way, there is a documentary on YouTube, but I'll be honest, I have not watched it yet. I just found out that it was on YouTube yesterday, uh, but it's called King Leopold's Ghost, and it will tell you in graphic detail uh, more stuff than I have told you, all right? I read the book, and the book was horrifying to read. So I can only imagine the documentary on YouTube will do the same thing. But anyway... So, that kind of concludes the Belgian Congo. I just wanted to throw that in there, okay? Pause if you need to, and then we're going to move on to our next essential question. All right, so, now we're going to move into 17.4. In this unit, in this lesson, guys, we are going to sweep through the rest of Africa and talk about what was going on in Southern Africa. Then we're going to move into Russia and what they were doing. And finally, we're going to end up back in Asia. So, our essential question today that I want you to focus on is what motivated Europeans to conquer Southern Africa and Southeast Asia, all right? And number two, how did native people respond to European presence? I think it's pretty clear the reasons why people are going, Europeans are going into these areas, right? They want natural resources, they want gold, they want uh, land, all of these things. And I'm pretty sure it's quite apparent how sometimes native people are reacting in almost every case. They are rising up physically and violently against the intrusions by the Europeans. And what we're going to see today is a lot more of that. Okay, so pause if you need to and let's jump into this. All right, now, so we're sweeping through different parts of Africa, right? We did Northern Africa, we did Western Africa, we did Central Africa, and now we're going to move down into Southern Africa. What I'm going to tell you in this slide particular is pretty gruesome, okay? So, now, interestingly enough, a lot of what's going to happen in Nazi Germany, some historians say, have a root in what happens in German colonies in Africa, all right? So... Let me elaborate. Maybe. Okay, so remember we talked about Bismarck, right? Bismarck, the guy that united Germany. Well, Bismarck wasn't really that concerned about imperialism until he started to see how imperialism might upset the balance of power in Europe. Now, believe it or not, even though Bismarck engaged in war to unite Germany, he's very much against a large-scale European war. And what Bismarck tries to do for the rest of his time as a leader of Europe is he tries to keep peace in Europe by balancing power. Now, he sees colonies as a chance to balance out that power. So, if Britain and France are all gaining in power and land, then Bismarck feels Germany needs to do the same. So, 
One of the places, the major place, guys, that Germany controls in Africa is a place that is called German Southwest Africa. All right. Today we call it Nam Namibia. So um, why are the Germans in this area particularly? What are they interested in? Well, there's a lot of things. There's diamonds, there's gold, there's copper, there's other metals. So once again, natural resources, precious metals. But another thing is this, once again, remember how I told you that for the most part, Europeans don't colonize or aren't like colonizing for living. This is another exception. So Germans are also using the land for settlement. All right. So a lot of Germans are flooding into this land. Now, you might say, OK, well, aren't there people living there? Yes. Don't those people control the land? Yes. Shouldn't the Germans stop? Yes, but guys, when does that ever stop, you know, Europeans from taking over other people's land? So let's talk about that, all right? If you look at this map right here, you can see there are a lot of groups of people. Now, it only shows two major groups of people that live in German Southwest Africa or what we'd call Namibia. Uh, but uh, the two major groups are the Herero and the Nama. But there's lots of other different groups that live there too. So what happened was um germans when they come in they basically force the herero and the nama and other groups of people off of their lands all right they push them onto marginal lands that are not really great for doing anything and the germans take the best land all right and what happens is eventually the herero and the nama people start to starve they start to lack natural resources they start to get desperate now what do you think people do when they start to get desperate they start to get violent right so the Herero and the Nama people start to rise up against the Germans. Why? Because they're starving and they don't have food and they don't have resources. And what do the Germans do? They attack them and wipe them out. All right. So some t history books guys have called these the Herero Wars, but I hesitate to call anything uh, between uh, tribal African people and Europeans with modern weapons a war. More like massacres, slaughters one of those kinds of words. So yes, there are fights. Okay. But remember what caused this fight Europeans did. So when natives rebel, the Germans fight them. And like I said, it's called the Herero wars, but I don't really consider that a war more like a massacre. All right. So in some cases, the Germans, uh, end up murdering men of the tribe and putting women and children into concentration camps. Now, I want to bring up this word, this phrase, concentration camp, because today when we think of concentration camps, we think of Nazi Germany. All right. Now, I want to tell you kind of what a concentration camp is. It's a place you put people that are usually rebellious or that are usually what you consider dangerous to kind of keep an eye on them. Now, concentration camps aren't necessarily designed as death camps like in Nazi Germany. All right. They're not designed necessarily to murder people. They are designed to keep people under control. All right. Now, I'm not trying to make a concentration camp sound good in any way, but I'm telling you that's what they're meant to do. Now, I will tell you, though, when you round people up, cram them into concentration camps and don't give them adequate food and water and things like that, people are going to die of disease and people are going to die of starvation. And that's exactly what happens at concentration camps. But concentration camps, you'll see throughout the next several chapters, guys, are not something that is unique to Germans. The British use them. The French use them. The United States used concentration camps during World War II, where we make Japanese Americans live on concentration camps. We call them internment camps, all right, because we are afraid of Japanese people and people of Japanese ancestry. So I want to kind of throw that out there. These are not like concentration camps with gas chambers and things like that. But at the same time, people are going to die at concentration camps and in large numbers. So one of the most infamous concentration camps in uh, German Southwest Africa is called Shark Island. All right. Here you see uh, German and her, uh, excuse me, not German, but here you see Herero people, possibly Nama people, and they are living. Look, guys, their, their, their dwellings, guys, are basically blankets and sticks and wood to try to hold up some kind of tent. All right. Now at Shark Island, thousands and thousands of people are going to die of horrible conditions. Now here's something that's terrifying. Um, before, I, well, I mean, it is estimated that Germans wiped out about 85% of, of the Herero population. But let me tell you something else that was going on at Shark Island. Experiments. Experimentation on humans. 
Remember social Darwinism? Remember this false idea of racial science that we talked about in chapter 16? This is going to be put into action in Shark Island. So when people die, when, when Nama Herrero people die, uh, they are dissected. Their heads are decapitated from their bodies and measured and sent all around the world for examination. If you were to go into some museums in Europe in the 1800s, you would see the severed, decapitated heads of African people from Southwest Africa, guys, and other places. Why? Because Europeans are kind of cataloging like a kind of racial science. All right. Now, hopefully by now, if you don't understand why social Darwinism is a dangerous idea, hopefully by now you do. All right. But some people and some historians have said this is kind of a precursor to what is going to go on at Nazi concentration camps where, yes, prisoners of concentration camps were experimented on, sometimes alive. Uh, and uh, these cruel experiments, guys, uh, often ended up in the deaths of thousands of people. So anyway, guys, that's what I'm saying is you kind of see early ideas of Nazi Germany in German Southwest Africa. Okay. So anyway, pause if you need to, and let's move on to our next part. All right. Now, Southern Africa. Now, this has kind of an interesting history here because the Dutch were in South Africa as early as about the mid 1600s. All right. So the Boers or the Afrikaners is what the Dutch who lived in South Africa called themselves. But like I said, they had colonized South Africa in the mid 1600s at this place called Cape Town. All right. So Cape Town, guys, is the very tip of Africa, basically uh, where um, where Europeans would round the the, the tip of southern uh, Africa and go into Asia way back, you know, in the in the 16th century, in the 17th century, and up until the in you know the creation of the Suez Canal. All right. So the Dutch were the first kind of Europeans to really colonize there. All right. Now, during the Napoleonic Wars, Great Britain, remember the Napoleonic Wars where Napoleon tried to, you know, capture parts of Europe, he even went into Egypt. And yes, uh, you know, it was a it was a major war that took place in, you know, places all over the world. But the British actually captured Cape Town and took it over from the Boers or the Dutch. All right. Oh, by the way, guys, like I said, Boers and Afrikaners, those are Dutch. OK. All right. Now. In the 1830s and the 1840s, the Boers, not surprisingly, did not want to live under control of the British. They wanted their own independent territory. So what they did was they went on this thing called the Great Trek. And the Great Trek, guys, was just this big migration north. And what they did was they created several uh, different independent states. One of them was called the Orange Free State and the other was called the Transvaal. So the Dutch were kind of like, screw you, Great Britain. We will go and make our own place in Southern Africa where we will be independent and we will do our own thing. Now, as the Dutch moved north, they actually encountered another empire that had been slowly growing in Southern Africa. And this was an African empire led by a tribe known as the Zulu. So the Boer and the British actually fought wars with the Zulu who were trying to also create their own empire in Africa. So the Zulu were an African tribe that were spreading out and trying to kind of create their own empire. Uh, and you might call these wars because in some cases Zulus actually won battles against the Boer and the British. But once again, they always succumb to modern weapons and, uh, and, and modern tactics of European militaries. So they come into contact with the Zulus. There's several fights, but ultimately Europeans like win these battles and they subdue these people. All right. Now here's the deal. Gold is discovered in Transvaal. Where the, where the Dutch tried to move and start their own uh, uh, start their own little colonies. So guess what? Great Britain's like, oh, gold's there? Well, hey, we want to be there too. So ultimately, this sparks a war known as the Boer Wars. Now, the Boer Wars, much like the Opium Wars, there's like a first Boer War and a second Boer War, but we're going to group them all together and just call them the Boer Wars. All right? So who are the Boer? Once again, they are the Dutch people that live in Africa. Okay. All right. So it's Britain versus the Boer, Britain versus the Dutch. Now, who do you think is going to win? Yes, you're right. The most powerful nation in the world at the time, Great Britain. So Great Britain wins and takes over South Africa. All right. Here you see guys, a photograph of interestingly, do you see all these guys kneeling down 
in what we would call a trench. When we get to World War One, and you'll see how trenches evolve into these massive things that we'll talk about in World War One. All right. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll, that's irrelevant. I was I was thinking of something, but like it doesn't matter. Pause if you need to. Now, what was life like under the British after they took over South Africa? Well, one thing I want to point out, because I didn't point it out on the last slide, is this. Guess what the British did? So the Boer, when they were started losing the war, the Boer uh, military started to re uh, resort to guerrilla tactics. Now, remember what guerrilla tactics are? Dirty fighting, not fighting fairly, all right? So when they start resorting to guerrilla tactics, that's when the British create concentration camps and they put Boer women and children in the concentration camps where many die of disease. Here's a photograph of a concentration camp. Here is a Boer woman, a Dutch woman and her child. You can see the child very much looks very sickly, uh, almost just skin and bones. All right. So a lot of Boer are going to die in concentration camps uh, by the British. Now, really interesting, Emmeline Pankhurst, remember her? Uh, she actually is an advocate uh, for uh, these people that live in these con uh, concentration camps. And she, during this time period, works really hard to kind of call out the British on uh, rounding up men and women and putting them in concentration camps. So she is a very much an advocate that kind of fights back against that. All right. Now, let's talk about life under the British. Well, when the British came in, they tried to do what all Europeans tried to do and kind of, quote unquote, civilize the territory. So one of the things they did was they outlawed slavery. Now, the Dutch, in some cases, still relied on African slaves in South Africa, even though the British had banned uh, African slavery uh, in the early 1800s. So they outlawed slavery in South Africa. And you might say, wow, good job, Great Britain. You've done a good thing. But... And a very big butt. And you guys know what I say about that. Anyway. White Europeans began to outnumber Africans in South Africa. So this is one of those places, again, where floods of white people are going to live in South Africa. If you go to South Africa today, there are still a large majority of white people that have for generations lived and grown up in South Africa. Okay. All right. Now the British are going to pass laws that forbade Africans from owning land. Now I want you to think about this guys. Imagine you live in South Africa. You are African. Here come these white people. They take over and they start passing laws that say you an African can't own land on your own land. Think about that guys. Well, what else? They create a legislature, but guess what? African people are not allowed to vote and they're not allowed to be in the legislature. So once again, you are an African in your own home country, in your own home territory, in your own land, and you don't have rights, not the right to own land, not the right to vote, not the right to say any, have any kind of say in your government. Guys, this is social Darwinism and this is imperialism. All right. Now, one of the most Infamous things that Great Britain did was they created these laws called apartheid. All right. Now, the best way I can describe apartheid is very kind of like, I don't know, very similar, kind of like um, the Jim Crow laws that existed in the American South. Now, if you don't know what Jim Crow laws are, um, after the American Civil War, there was this time period called Reconstruction. And then after Reconstruction, basically, uh, Southern governments started to pass racist laws and started to create segregation. All right. And guys, from basically the 1880s all the way up until maybe the 1970s or maybe in some places, even the 80s, America in the South was still very segregated. Now, what does segregated means? It means, guys, separated. You had white areas and you had black areas. All right. And only those areas were where only those people went. All right. So apartheid basically separate, separated or segregated Europeans and Africans. All right. So here are some uh, photographs, guys, where you see signs uh, that show apartheid. Like, hey, European women here, European men here, non-European women are over here. All right. Okay. Here's the same thing, guys, for use by white people. All right. This area is only for use by white people. All right. Uh, this beach is only for use by white people. So once again, guys, here are Europeans coming into African territories and telling African people that, hey, this is off limits. Now, 
You can imagine that the areas for white people and the areas for African people were not in anywhere equal or in anywhere as nice or anything like that, very much like the American South, okay? So, Americans were denied, or excuse me, Africans were denied basic civil rights until the 1990s, guys. I remember the day the first African person became president. His name was Nelson Mandela. All right, I was in high school when they elect their first African president, guys, and that was when I was in high school. So, up until I was in high school, guys, they never even had a black leader. Okay? So this lasts for a very, very long time, and we'll talk about apartheid and things a little bit later on. Okay? Pause if you need to. All right, now, we haven't talked about Russia, and I'm just going to kind of breeze through Russia, all right, kind of what they did. But yes, even backward Russia is going to start uh, colonizing, and it's not a new thing because we've talked about them doing this before. So let's talk about Russian imperialism. All right, guys, here's a map of everything that Russia had conquered up before 1800. Now think about all the, the time periods we've talked about. We talked about Catherine the Great. You guys remember Catherine the Great, the absolute ruler of Russia, and how she spread uh, the Russian Empire and took over parts of Western Europe, uh, the Baltic Sea. And we talked about how Peter the Great moved the capital to St. Petersburg. Well, guys, Russia is its not a new thing that Russia had been, like, colonizing, all right? But that was kind of the old imperialism. And during this time period, Russia is uh, also going to, you know, spread into Asia. Oh, one more thing. Also, guys, remember, Russia also expanded into Poland when we talked about the partitions of Poland. You guys remember how Poland slowly got gobbled up by, like, Austria and Prussia and Russia, right? Okay. But anyway, so yeah, obviously, Russia has expanded into Poland. All right, now, in the 19th century, Russia is going to move east and into the Ottoman lands and Asia. So one of the things that you are starting to see now is the Ottoman Empire, after the Crimean War, is going to slowly just get gobbled up by Europe. All right, the end of the Ottoman Empire is actually going to come in World War I, which is the next chapter. So, where does Russia go? Well, if you look at these arrows, guys, it's kind of hard to see because it's a terrible map, but they go into parts of Persia, which is modern-day Iran. They go into Chechnya, Dagestan, Circassia, Uzbekistan, Turkestan, Afghanistan. All of these were taken over by Russia, all right, in the 1800s, which are partly in the Middle East, some of them, partly or some of them are in Asia, okay? Now, what's really fascinating is, guys, these are going to have very lasting, long-term consequences, just like every other area of imperialism, okay? So, let me pause just for a second. Do you guys ever wonder why there's so much turmoil and so many problems in places like Africa today, in places like Asia today, and places like the Middle East, guys? A big reason for all of that is imperialism, okay? All right, now, um, Afghanistan is going to be a very big problem in what we call the Cold War later on. All right. Uh, in Chechnya, uh, Chechnya is going to try to break away uh, from uh, Russia and in, uh, in the 2000, early 2000s. And guys, it's going to be, you know, wildly put down by Vladimir Putin. So all of these things, guys, are going to lead to consequences later on. Now, here's something else interesting. A lot of these territories were dominated by Muslims. And as you can imagine, guys, Muslim people uh, do not want to be ruled by, you know, Russian Christian people. So they are going to rebel. All right. A lot of these areas that Russia is expanding to are not culturally, ethnically, linguistically similar to Russia, but Russia is nevertheless going to conquer them. Okay. So yes, Russia is expanding to pause if you need to. All right. We're almost done here, guys. Stay with me. Western powers in Asia. Now I've got a lot to say about this, but I'm going to kind of have to run through it at the same time. So let's talk about France. All right, guys. Now, France, uh, since the 1600s, had been in what we would call Southwest Asia, all right? As a matter of fact, excuse me, Southeast Asia. Uh, and as a matter of fact, they were mostly in this area that we called Indochina. What is Indochina? What do we call it today? We call it Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, all right? So if you look at the map right here, there's China up in the north uh, east corner. There's Thailand right there. Now, what you can't see, guys, is a little bit to the west of Thailand, there is British Burma, and then a little bit to the west of that is India, all right? So, British India. So anyway, guys, you see that area called Anam? That is what we call Vietnam today, 
All right, so the French were in Vietnam and the French missionaries spread Catholicism, like I said, as early as the 1600s, okay? By the way, have you ever heard of the Vietnam War that we fought in the 1960s? Guess what? It starts here, imperialism. So, 1856, Napoleon III, remember guys, Napoleon III? Napoleon III sends troops to Vietnam to create a French naval base and to, quote unquote, protect its missionaries. Now, remember I told you one of the big reasons for imperialism is strategic and military advantage, right? And that's exactly what the French are doing here. They are putting naval bases in Southeast Asia, all right? And they say they're protecting missionaries. But what else are they doing in this area? Well, there's a lot of money to be made. There's a lot of wealth to be made in imperialism. So France, just like every other nation, exploits local people as labor, and they establish monopolies. Remember, guys, monopoly is when you have a complete control over a certain resource or good or economy. They uh, establish complete monopolies over a lot of goods like salt, opium, and rice. Now, you might say, opium, isn't that what the British do? Yes, guys, it's not just the British that are selling opium into China. It's Portugal, it's France, it's a lot of different groups that are trying to make money and do the exact same thing that Britain is doing, all right? So anyway, the French guys are doing the same thing, and the French guys are going to have a very lucrative, which means very profitable, trade in rice, once again, by using local people as labor. So... Oh, here, guys, I, I thought this was interesting. So, guys, uh, another magazine, you know, we talk about the magazine Puck all the time. Well, another magazine is Punch. It does the same thing. And this, I kind of wanted to point this out. This, guys, is a British political cartoon kind of showing the ruthlessness of the French. It says, the French wolf and the Siamese lamb, all right? Basically, it's saying, look at the French wolf and look at the poor little Southeast Asian lamb, how helpless it is. And, you, and so basically the, the British are criticizing the French for being ruthless. But at the same time, you might say, okay, British, like you're one to talk. And this is the thing, guys. This time period, you know, Europeans are criticizing each other over how ruthless they are with imperialism. But they are all being ruthless. They're all being bad. Now, not as bad as the Belgian Congo. All right. Uh, the British and the French aren't lopping off people's heads, hands, and, 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 you know, other things to get rubber, all right? But at the same time, they're not innocent, okay? So, now, let's talk about the good old United States. You might say, well, what's the United States doing at this time? Guys, I would love to tell you that the United States was noble, the United States was innocent, and the United States did not get involved in any of these kind of imperial exploitations, but guys, I'd be lying. Before we talk about the acquisitions of the United States, I'd first like to bring up something that I don't, I've never seen really history books kind of point out. But let's talk about, and you're going to learn this in A-Push next year, all of these things that I'm about to teach you right now, you're going to learn in A-Push next year. But let's talk about something big. Guys, ever since Europeans and people from the United States, guys, have been in the United States, we have pretty much engage in imperialism against Native Americans. Think about what does imperialism mean? You take over people's land. Up, oh, that's what the United States did. Uh, you engage in wars with Native people. Yep, United States did. Check. You take over their land for natural resources such as rivers, waters, even gold. Check. All right, check. So guys, I would call how the United States treated Native Americans uh, throughout their history imperialism. All right, it's absolutely the same thing. So I wanted to throw in there that's not in the book or not in the books about imperialism, guys, is that, yes, they're doing the same thing, all right? They've been doing it with Native Americans, but let's talk about how they move away from Native Americans and they try to colonize the rest of the world. All right, so here's the deal. All right, whoa. All right, now, the U.S. opened trade with Japan in 1850. Boy, I wish I had time to sit there and tell you this story. I'm going to tell you a brief version of it, but the arrow, guys, is the U.S. opening trade with Japan. You see, Japan had been closed to the United States and to anybody, guys. Japan had closed off its its borders to Europeans since the 1600s, all right? Uh, the I told you guys a long time ago, way back early on in, in the in early chapter at the beginning of the year, that basically J the Japanese were so sick of Portuguese missionaries and Christians causing problems throughout Japan that they that they expelled all foreigners. They said from now on, no foreigners are allowed. Although they did let the Dutch show up 
and a port, but they didn't let basically any foreigners go in Japan. So largely, guys, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, Japan had been closed off to all Westerners. Now, what does this mean? It means, guys, the world industrialized without Japan. So, in 1850, the United States rolls up with modern metal steam-powered ships and basically threatens the Japanese that they better open trade. Now, the Japanese at this time are still using armor, katana, spears, bows and arrows, their samurai. They did not modernize. Why? Because they were closed off to Europeans and Westerners for 200 years. There's a fun movie to watch, guys. It's called The Last Samurai. It's not exactly historically accurate, but you do get to see European armies with modern weapons face off against samurai wearing armor and carrying swords and bows and arrows. It's fascinating. But anyway, we open trade with Japan in 1850, and what we start is... Uh, and we, we actually don't colonize them, right? Because Japan willingly opens trade, they never get overrun, they never get taken over. And you know what they do, guys? They ad eventually adapt all of our modern uh, technology, all of our modern ideas, all of our modern weapons, and they become a modern, industrialized, powerful nation that we then have to fight in World War II. Now, what else? Well, in 1867, uh, the United States buys Alaska from Russia, Russia owned what we would call Alaska today, and they sell it. Um, they sell it to the United States. And when the United States buys it, um, this guy named William Seward is the guy that you know really pushed for buying it. Uh, and when we bought it, uh, basically everybody made fun of Seward, like, "Good job! You just spent millions of dollars to buy the United States a big rock of ice." Later on, oil and gold was discovered in Russia, and then, or excuse me, in, in Alaska. And then Russia was like, "Sad face that you know they didn't discover all that." But you'll learn about that. In a push next year. Now, what else? Well, another brutal, like, dirty story about how the United States took Hawaii. Once again, guys, I don't want to ruin all the stuff you're going to learn in A-Push and kind of spend too much time, but long story short, uh, basically, U.S. sugar planters overthrew the queen of Hawaii, Liliu Okalani, and basically what they did was they told the United States to annex or add Hawaii to the United States, all because they didn't want to pay taxes on sugar. Well, you'll learn about that next year. But bottom line is, we actually overthrew a queen in Hawaii and then annexed Hawaii as a territory. Okay? So then, what else did we do? Well, another great story that... Guys, there's two more great stories that I wish I had time to spend like an hour telling you. But basically, we fight Spain... In 1898, we have this thing called the Spanish-American War, okay? Basically, Spain uh, was afraid of losing all their colonies. Cuba tries to rebel, and the Spanish send military into Cuba and start rounding up Cubans into concentration camps, and the United States feels compelled to help out the Cubans. We don't like the Spaniards over in our hemisphere persecuting people. And uh, basically, the, uh, a United States battleship called the USS Maine explodes in the harbor of, of Havana, which is in Cuba, and all the newspapers blame Spain, and basically we're like mad about this warship, uh, our, our battleship getting exploded, and uh, what happens is we declare war on Spain, and in six months, we completely annihilate the Spanish Navy, and we take every single Spanish colony that they have left. We take over Guam, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the Philippines. We eventually give Cuba the right to rule themselves. After World War II, we give the Philippines the right to rule themselves. But guess what, guys? Remember how we thought that the Spaniards blew up our ship and we declared war? Yeah, our ship blew up on its own. There was a small fire that got started on the ship and it spread to the uh, ammunition and boom, it was a complete accident. So we declared war on Spain over a complete accident that had nothing to do with them. And we took every one of their colonies. So once again, guys, the United States is dirty. But one more thing. All right. Now, the Spanish-American War actually taught the United States a very big lesson. You see, most of the United States Navy was right here at Pearl Harbor. And a lot of the war took place in Cuba. So look, how can our ships, guys, look at my cursor. How can we get our ships to Cuba. Well, you had to go north that way, which is dangerous because of icebergs and, and frozen waters, or you could go around South America, but that took too long. So, Americans start getting this idea, what if we could cut a canal, a big ditch through Panama, and then we could move our ships from Hawaii through the Panama Canal and connect the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. The only problem was, Panama was owned by Colombia. So you know what we did? We basically started a revolution. Oh, yeah, there's Puerto Rico and Cuba. We actually, guys, involved in starting a revolution in Panama so that Panama breaks away from Colombia 
And then we buy the canal from Panama. Very dirty thing that we started a revolution just so we could steal the Panama Canal from Colombia. Actually, we didn't steal the canal. We stole Panama. Well, Panama stole itself, but we helped them. And then we cut a canal in Panama, and then we connect the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean. So, guys, look, the United States is doing some dirty things. Oh, and let's not even forget about what happened in the Philippines. You can imagine, guys, Filipino people, just like a lot of people, did not want to be ruled by the United States. So they rose up against the United States. And, guys, uh, there was a bloody war called the Philippine, uh, the Philippine-American War. Um, and basically, U.S. military fought Filipino people. And in some cases, guys, uh, now, I will admit that both sides engaged in atrocities against each other. All right. Uh, but there was uh, there's a couple cases, guys, where um, the United States military would wipe out entire villages of Filipino people. All right. Why? Trying to put down what they would call a rebellion. And some of these villages that they wiped out were innocent and not even fighting. So once again, guys, imperialism is a nasty business and the United States was very much involved in it. Pause if you need to. Oh, yeah, there's the Panama Canal. OK. So there, guys, right there is the uh, the Empire of America. All right, pause if you need to. Okay, the very last thing I want to talk about is the Boxer Uprising in China. So remember how Great Britain and Europeans are now flooding into China. Well, China was ruled by the last dynasty that they're going to be ruled by. It's called the Qing Dynasty. All right, but as you have seen over this last course of several, you know, hundred years, China has slowly been invaded by foreigners. After the Opium Wars, especially after the Treaty of Nanking and the Treaty of Tianjin, now here come the white people, right? So, Europeans, when we left off, had carved up China into spheres of influence. That is, areas in China where only those countries had exclusive trading rights. So you can see by the different colors, guys, who is allowed to trade where in China. But once again, guys, the Qing Dynasty is no longer really in power it's Europeans now that are cutting up China, just like they cut up Africa, just like they cut up everywhere. All right. So now the United States was kind of too late to get a sphere of influence. And we saw China slowly being gobbled up and absorbed by Europeans. Now, the United States had a couple thoughts. Number one, oh, crap. If Europeans take over China, then we won't be allowed to trade in China and make money. And on the other hand, the, U the U.S. kind of realized, oh, crap, if Europeans start uh, getting into fights over the spheres of influence, that might lead to a global world war. And it kind of does later on in 1914. So the United States proposes this idea called the open door policy. All right. So what is the open door policy? This said that all countries should be able to trade freely in China, even the United States. All right, now, at first, all Europeans were like, whatever, United States, you're just trying to jump in on the action and get your own little sphere of influence. So, at first, Europeans were very reluctant to open the door to China and allow free trade for everybody and get rid of spheres of influence, okay? But that's all about to change. Now, do you guys remember the Sepoy Uprising in, in India, right? All of these changes over the course of several hundred years had slowly you know, got into the minds of Indian people and they had a breaking point and they'd had enough. Well, the same thing is about ready to happen to China. And it's a fascinating and brutal story. So, meanwhile, many Chinese people are going to start resenting Western influence and dominance. Now, one group in particular was called the Order of the Harmonious Fist. But Europeans nicknamed them Boxers. Now, they nicknamed them the boxers because when they would train out in the open, they would often shadow box on walls. Now, here's the deal. The Order of the Harmonious Fist was a Chinese nationalist group, and their goal was to eventually eliminate Westerners and all Western influence. One of the things they hated most was Christianity, because in some cases, uh, Christian missionaries had been so aggressive that they had torn down Chinese sacred temples because they thought they were pagan and, and you know, they had tried to change the religion of China. So uh, they went after Westerners, guys, and they want to eliminate Chinese people who convert to Christianity as well, they would consider them traitors. As a matter of fact, guys, most Chinese have a word for Europeans. They call Europeans barbarians. So anyway, let me tell you a little bit about this Order of the Harmonious Fist, as you can see from a picture of some of the boxers right here in a photograph. The Order of the Harmonious Fist went around recruiting followers, and they told followers that with their techniques, 
that they could even be basically impervious or be able to basically stop modern European weapons. They actually did demonstrations on the streets where boxers would shoot each other with rifles and not die. Now, Europeans would say, oh, well, you know, there's no bullet in the chamber, there's no bullet in the rifle, therefore, it's just gunpowder blowing up falling blanks. But, remember, Chinese people are angry, they're desperate, and a lot of people, when they're angry and desperate, they turn to religion, and some of their religion, you know, religious ideas become what we consider not exactly, you know, rational. Okay? The idea that you can block bullets and stop modern weapons. So... The boxers, on one day in 1902, guys, decided to attack. So throughout different cities in China, the boxers rose up and in the streets started murdering Chinese Christians and Western Europeans. It's very much like the Sepoy Uprising. All right, they killed thousands of people. All right, some in some instances, uh, white Europeans were beheaded in the streets. Chinese people were beheaded in the streets. But guys, it was a big slaughter. Now, eventually... Europeans, the French, British, Germans, even the United States, sends in help to put the rebellion down, and the rebellion is stopped. And after the rebellion, guys, basically, all the Western armies put down the rebellion, and they forced the emperor to pay large amounts of money. Now, guys, the Boxer Rebellion is going to be pretty much a signal for the end of the Qing Dynasty, because after the Boxer Rebellion, uh, China is going to be in so much debt to Westerners, and also, Westerners are also going to agree to the open-door policy. So more and more white Europeans are going to flood into China. It's going to cause a Chinese civil war where the Chinese are fighting each other. And eventually, it's ultimately going to lead to the rise of this guy named Mao and the beginning of China as a communist country, which it still is today. All right. So all of these things have lasting long-term effects that we still consider a, a huge problem today. All right. So anyway, guys, that's the end of the notes. Uh, I will hit you up uh, a little bit later and we'll do the next thing. We've got one more lesson, guys, in imperialism and we'll be done with the chapter. I hope you guys have a great day.